You are listening to New Theory Radio. Hello and welcome to another edition of New Theory Radio, here live on News Talk Saga 960 AM. My name is Nav Nanwa, I am your host, and this is the show where we theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture, and everyday life. We have a jam-packed edition of the show lined up for you this week. Uh, We are actually going to be kicking off a five-week look at the documentary series The Last Dance, which profiles Michael Jordan's last season with the Chicago Bulls, the 97-98 team, which is considered uh, one of the best, or if not the best, sports franchise of all time. And it's truly an event. It is an event. TV that's uh, being given to us on a weekly basis, and and I thought because of the magnitude of this documentary and what it's covering, I thought why not talk about it weekly on New Theory Radio with a brand new guest, and we are kicking that off this week with a good friend of mine. She is somebody who used to be a Toronto Raptors uh, blogger, actually used to have a series uh, where she used to interview a bunch of the players called Inside the Purple Room, which is still available online if you want to see some vintage Raptors content. She used to work in social for NBA Canada as well as MLSC. She's currently now in the U.S. uh, as a sports content marketing manager, and uh, I'm very excited to have her back on New 3 Radio as my good friend, Bile Doshi, and We dive deep into the first two episodes, so I hope you enjoy that. And then I welcome to the show uh, my brothers. They are a local rap group here that's absolutely killing it, and you guys are probably no stranger to them at all. If you're listening to this show, it is uh, my homies moving cool. Brown, magician himself, B-Magic, as well as uh, NTR alum, Noise. They both come on the show to talk about Their new track, produced by Empower Music, called Out of Breath, which they just launched a few weeks ago. It is a fire track. I urge you to check it out. As well, being that they are a duo that's been around working working together for, you know, over 10 years, um, I thought it'd be great just to talk about and theorize on some of the best duos within sports, pop culture, and music and and what really makes a duo work and then we are going to close things out by welcoming uh the founder of a wonderful organization called chatting to wellness which is really focused on improving the mental health of seniors that are in homes all across the the gta and that is uh, Mahad Shazad. He's an individual that I met a few weeks ago, or actually a few months ago, at an event. Uh, he's very passionate on looking after the mental health of our elders, and especially now with COVID-19 happening and the fact that we are seeing a ton of cases uh, being isolated in senior homes. Um, the well-being of our elders is, is truly something that we all need to keep in mind. And Mahad and his team have actually come up with a service where they uh, offer online chatting as well as uh, video conversations to elders who may be feeling lonely during this time. All this and more on this week's episode of New Theory Radio. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we are talking about the first two episodes of The Last Dance with my good friend Bile Doshi here on News Talk Saga 960 AM. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Every day that Scotty wasn't playing gave someone else confidence that they can beat us. And if you're trying to maintain dominance over people, you don't want to give them a chance to 
gain confidence. And we are back here on New Theory Radio, here live on News Talk Saga 960 AM. My name is Nav Nanwa. I am your host, and this is the show where we theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture, and everyday life. It is no secret that during this quarantine, one of the biggest events that we were all looking forward to occurred last week, and that is... The premiere of The Last Dance, which is a 10-part documentary focusing on Michael Jordan and the 97-98 Chicago Bulls. Uh, It was The Last Dance for that dynasty as they were heading into their sixth championship run. And what a fascinating look. What a fascinating take on just a historic franchise within sports history uh i'm sure everyone's been watching it whether in the u.s checking it out checking it out on espn or whether you're in canada here watching it on netflix and it's truly riveting because you're you're getting a behind the scenes look at this monstrous team that was truly filled with uh larger than life personalities as this is the first time since 97 98 this footage is finally Bit being put out and we're, we're getting these perspectives and we're getting these interviews from the likes of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman. So over the next five weeks, we are going to be talking about the last dance here on new theory radio, because again, there's a lot of different themes, topics, a whole bunch of information loaded in, in, in this series that I think would be totally applicable to what we're sort of seeing right now, whether it be in sports or in life. And if I'm going to be doing stuff around basketball, it only makes sense for me to call on my good homie. She is somebody who uh, was a, uh, uh, I would say, one of the OG Raptor bloggers slash content creators because she used to have her own Raptors blog. Remember the Inside the Purple Room, right, Bile? Yes, of course. And then you went on to do stuff with uh, Rod, uh, with, with you know, with Omni, and then you actually used to, you know, work, you know, on social for the Raptors. Now you're in the U.S. Uh, in a role that we can't disclose because it might be enemy territory. But anyways, I do want to welcome you here, uh, my good friend, no stranger to New Theory Radio, Bile Doshi's here. Bile, thanks so much for making time for us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on. Yeah, we are too. And again, like I mentioned, if I'm going to be talking basketball, I had to give you the call. And, and I'm grateful that you're our sort of first guest to do this look back on the two episodes. But before we begin, you know, how is the quarantine treating you right now? The quarantine is good. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I do get stir crazy at home. But I am trying to pick up some projects, some hobbies. I, uh, Try to work out consistently. I'm trying to take some online courses. Like that's been that's been a new thing for me too. Trying to uh, study up on work. And you know what? I'm actually working on a Toronto skyline puzzle. Oh, nice! Yep. Amazing. And I am making no progress. Painting. <laughs> 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 Hey, I know puzzle sales were through the roof. I know my wife was looking into getting some puzzles, and they were completely backlogged on Amazon. So kudos to you for being able to snag one. Yeah, I know. And and the Toronto one, nonetheless, of course, I had to get that. Um, so I'm hoping I can finish it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe you'll finish it by the time uh, episodes 9 and 10 of The Last Dance air in like four weeks. Exactly. That should be my goal. <laughs> <laughs> but as a basketball reporter, analyst, social media specialist, and more importantly, a fan, how stoked were you about The Last Dance? And, and better yet, how much are you missing basketball right now? I miss it so much. I mean, I feel like it's part of my life. So to not see it, it, it kind of hurts, you know? Um, so when I heard about everyone at ESPN saying that they were going to actually move up the documentary, which was supposed to air in June, yeah, April 19th, I mean, it made for a good pre-birthday present to me. And so <laughs> <laughs> I was stoked. I literally was just sitting in anticipation for it and once it came on it was just really cool to just get a better understanding of michael jordan and those last year that last year with that team yeah and you know what the the entire bulls franchise during that time was there's it's like the entire 
situation there is is just like sports mystique, right? Like it's really held in high regard when you think about number one, Michael Jordan being the athlete of the '90s, but number two, the run that they had, like the fact that they were able to win uh, six championships, they were able to run it back three times twice. Like it is absolutely phenomenal. And and again, I remember seeing the trailer for this. I think Christmas Day, twenty eighteen. And I remember I was like, man, this is amazing. Like, I can't wait for this to come out. And then the last shot was uh, coming 2020. And I was like, no, why? <laughs> I was like, we need this now. But you could, you could see by just watching the first two episodes why it took so long because it is really well put together. It is so well put together. Um, I had heard... And had read that uh, every time there were producers who had all this footage, but it was just in the vault for like 10 years until yeah. just presented it to Michael in such a way that really made him think, hey, yeah, let's do it. And it was, I, I heard it was um, the day that the Cavaliers won the NBA championship in 2016 is when he said yes. <laughs> how, how fitting considering the uh the polarizing relationship between lebron james and michael jordan exactly exactly <laughs> but yeah just to that i'm glad you brought that up because i when a while this came out what was super fascinating to me was the fact that we saw like footage that had to your point been in the vault for you know close to what 20 well, well yeah over 20 years yeah and like what like to me in the back of my mind I was like what else exists like this like what else is out there that we've never seen that people maybe people have content uh like have footage of that is probably collecting dust in some warehouse that would make for intriguing viewing and and uh again I, I think the story goes that Adam Silver who's now the commissioner now was um you know was a part of the NBA entertainment division and he was the one that you know was instrumental in allowing Michael Jordan and the Bulls to uh, give him full access. And then to your point, like they captured all this footage, but um, yeah, I literally kind of sat in the ESPN vault. I think uh, to your point earlier about different producers, like I'd heard that like Spike Lee, Danny DeVito, like he, a lot of people had uh, just an idea of wanting to put this together. And uh, it wasn't until, um, 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 Mike Tolan, who is someone who's uh, a, a really well-renowned producer, who who I think uh, was who I think worked on the O.J. Simpson documentary, right. um, Made in America, which is also really good. Um, it wasn't until that O.J. Simpson documentary premiered, and the fact that now we live in an age where you don't have to take hours and hours of footage and bring it down to like an hour and a half documentary. You can do a ten-part series and still capture people's attention. That I guess Michael just felt that it's the right time to put it out. And what was also compelling about that too is the way that in which he presented it to Michael as well. I believe he had also said that you know people want to see you, and those who weren't in that era don't really know you this that that way. Yeah, and we want to shed light on who you were and. And, you know, why Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan. So I think that is what triggered him also to to really um, give the rights to say, yes, OK, let's do it. And I know he also had um, full um, full disclosure in saying yes or allowing access to or putting the documentary together in which he how he wanted to be um, portrayed. Yeah, 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 I know that that was a big deal, just like the way that they they were able to get a lot of this behind the scenes footage of this last season. Uh, it sounds like Michael was very instrumental in just the creation of the documentary. And you know what? I, I for one, am a firm believer that when you're a legend or an absolute just powerhouse in your industry, and if people are really trying to seek more information about why you do the things that you do or what really motivates you. Like I'd rather hear that perspective come from that person versus it happened after the fact. Like, you know, again, I always, I always 
uh, you know, one well, actually just one documentary that I'm watching right now is uh, it, it's a series. It's it's by Viceland. It's you know again I'm a big pro wrestling fan, so there's a series called Dark Side of the Ring, and they're kind of exploring all of these unique wrestling stories that have a very sort of grim nature to them. But uh, the piece that's always missing is the person that lived it, right? Like they're never they're never interviewed. They're ne- you know obviously for reasons being you know whether they passed away or they're behind bars. But I think being able to hear someone's perspective firsthand, I think, is what makes it so important. And again, this documentary, outside of maybe, uh, you know, obviously for, for reasons because he passed away a few years ago, outside of not getting Jerry Krause's perspective, right. of recent perspective, I think for the most part, the key people are there. Like, there's even, there's interviews with David Stern and, you know, R.I.P. David Stern, he passed away earlier this year. And then, you know, on, there's also interviews, I believe, with Kobe Bryant as well. So R.I.P. to him too. But I think being, the fact that they were able to capture all that is, is fantastic. I, I completely agree. I think it, it made for a really profound um, documentary and it, it and allows us to anticipate what we can expect going forward as well. Um, and it just, it just gets me all motivated that I can't wait for me to come around, you know, to just like be in front of my TV to actually watch this. Yeah, it's it's like uh, it's event viewing now. Like I find that even um, even like me and my wife, we, we bought we, we watched both episodes on Netflix. Cause you, well, you live in the states. Spoiler alert! So you get to watch it a day before us. Exactly. But um, now you know because. My, my my wife Anu, who's a big Raptors fan, she grew up in India, so she obviously knew about Michael Jordan, but she wasn't didn't watch this run that he was on. But so we watched the first two episodes on Monday, and she was captivated. And I think it's now going to be our thing that every Monday we're going to sit down and we're going to watch both episodes because we just like the way that's told. And you know what better way? Uh, you know I'm thankful that ESPN decided to put this out early because I think we all needed it. I know as soon as this quarantine hit, there was like um, various uh, petitions online for this to be released. So I'm glad that there was you know I'm glad ESPN listened and they were able to put it together. But let's just get right into it. Um, you know again the first episode I found very very intriguing in regards to how they set the stage because you're almost. You're almost, uh, uh, you know, we're joining in on, uh, on the first episode you know, and on the tail end of their 97 title win. And again, there's this press conference taking place and there's rumors that, you know, the front office, you know, Jerry Krause and, uh, and owner Jerry Reinsdorf are very much focused on wanting to rebuild because their star players are getting older. And again, they've won five chips already. And Michael is, is very vocal about, hey, if it's not broken, why fix it? And that seems to be the theme throughout the entire documentary. And I think we're going to see it in the next few episodes. But how did you find that uh, the general manager, Jerry Krause, how did you find that he came across? Because there's it's been very de- uh, decisive online uh, regarding, again, uh, w- is this somebody that was getting bullied by basketball players? Is this somebody that really had it out for the players because he really believed that it wasn't players that won championships, it was organizations. And uh, and and do you feel maybe his portrayal is unfair considering he's no longer with us? I, I see both perspectives in a way, too. Um, I do feel bad for him in the sense that I, I would have loved if he was still here to really get his interpretation of how he was portrayed. But, I mean, then I do side with the players. The players are the... Are the and, and Jordan is the one that, you know was front and center in this in these championships so why i to his point break something you know if it doesn't need to be broken Mm -hmm. and um but then i i saw the the way that he was bullied and the the jokes that they would you know just make fun of his height it bothered me in a way too you know this is this is your um this this is the one who's pretty much can do what he wants. If he wants to pull the trade for you, he can go ahead and do that. I mean, he held all of the, um, all of the power in, in a way. Uh, so I thought that was intriguing to really, to really understand. Um, and, and I just felt like he wanted to be part of their, of their group, you know, and he just really wasn't accepted that same way. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's very it, just to bring a Toronto example to this. Like you think about Masai Jury, right? And you think about his relationship with the players. 
And there is a sense of respect there. Like you see it, like you see, like, you know, you, you see that the play, you know, he really believes in his players. He obviously has to make the tough decisions when it comes to thinking about the team and it's winning potential because his job is reliant on the team winning. And we've seen him make decisions in the past that haven't gone over too well. And, you know, the DeMar Kawhi trade was one of them a few years ago. But I, I think there is a level of respect there. And and that's the one thing I noticed, too, was, you know, they at first they really painted Jerry in a negative light. Again, uh, uh, Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner, the current owner of the Bulls, talks about how when he bought the team, um, you know, he hired Jerry Krause and people had told him not to hire him, but he decided to do it anyways because he needed somebody that could put a team together. And it, it seems like he's the villain. Like somebody somebody is convinced there was a there's a theory online that uh, Jerry Krause was the uh, was the inspiration for the villain in Space Jam, the one that was in charge of the monsters. <laughs> I heard I, I read that too. I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh wait, that's that's not too far fetched. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like to your point, like it did kind of bother me. Like it almost to me showed just it, like I found that when you saw Jordan crack the joke about like diet pills, and then you saw you know the, towards the end of episode two where they talk about Scotty Pippen, you know, yelling at him on the bus, it really to me showed just how far we've come. You know, in the last 20 years, because I think back in the day, it was probably more acceptable. But I think if you see a situation like that now, not so much. No, I agree. I I don't think uh, now there there is um, to your point, there is respect. And and I feel like a lot more in this day and age uh, is kind of um, like with the with social media now, too. I mean. I feel like owners have to kind of understand who that player is, who they're dealing with, how to kind of go about talking to individuals. And that makes for maybe a better nucleus with it when you work in the confines of that team. Yeah, no, I I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I I think um, the owner player relationship, or even in this case, the general manager player relationship is, is always fascinating to me because you know, you got somebody who's thinking of the best interest of the team. They're also thinking about the best interest of the player, but then they also are the ones that have to make the hard decisions. And, you know, it's somewhat polarizing, you know, to, to, to the point where, you know, again, you almost kind of feel for Jordan. Cause again, if it ain't broke, why fix it? But yeah. then at some point you could be this dynasty that's winning champions, championships over championships, over championships, but once you won like five or six championships, like is it truly enough at that point, or do you think you should continue with that winning attitude? Exactly. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. If um, like, is there going to be like? I guess then it's that adrenaline, right, and that excitement of of wanting to win, and the the amount of pressure that you might put on yourself to know, okay we've done this. Why not try again? You know, yeah. um, I'm sure there's a different hurdle we have to overcome, but who's to say we can't do it. Right. All, all of the target is on that team at that particular point. Yeah, no, I agree. It's interesting that, that dynamic. How did you find that Michael Jordan came across? Cause Michael Jordan in interviews leading up to this episode stated that he felt that when people see this documentary, they're not going to like him. You know what? I I I disagree. I, I think I I I find I guess I, I feel a little bit more respect for him too. Um in the sense of when he first came to that team, I, he was he was that rookie, but he he seemed to be isolated from the other players or or at least um lived in such a way that was different like I remember he brings up the example of I guess they were on the road and he was wondering where the team was and then he had gone to get something for the players and it turns out there was a party going on in one person's room and there was things that he had never seen he says happening he's like I don't want to be a part of this I want to get out of here immediately and that's when he started to I guess distance himself and just really uh, focus on the game and and how much 
hard work he was putting into the game and what he wanted at the game, um, it really showed his confidence, his confidence level. And, and as it grew, um, and I thought that that's what really stood out to me. Yeah, me too. Like I, it's funny. Cause I think you're referring to what the Chicago bulls cocaine circus, <laughs> uh, which I thought was hilarious. Um, yeah. But like to your point, I it's Michael Michael Jordan is pretty much uh, a description now of someone who is the absolute best. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, okay, sure he's intense, but his intensity is justified because dude's a legend. Like, and I remember there's been aspects of uh, of just some of his comments that I turned to my wife and I'm like. Only Michael Jordan can get away with this. <laughs> like only only he can come across and 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 have this very high regard as to who he is and just how intense he is and and really hold himself in high light because dude can back it up. Like he was able to carry the team when Pippen was injured. Um, he was able to bring out the best out of everyone. Like it was truly during that 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 mid nineties even towards the late eighties, like late eighties, mid nineties era of Michael Jordan. Like those are some special, special performances. Like you're, you're seeing superhuman things go down on that court. And what I didn't know was that in UNC, he hit that the game winning jumper. And that's when he said he went from being Mike, to Michael. Yeah, that was, yeah, that, that's a very Michael Jordan statement. <laughs> Exactly. That was that. No, no, that was that was certainly a good one. Um, what did you think of? Like, there was. How am I going to frame this up? Like, what? Again, we talk about how intense Michael was. We talk about just this, you know, lack for lack of a better term, arrogance that he had, sort of, you know, heading into this season. But then you do get flashbacks to his personal life and the fact that he came from a very competitive family. Uh, did you like the fact that the documentary would go backwards and forwards a lot? Like, do you think, do you think that like just from a documentary filming standpoint, cause you know, you have a, a TV background. Um, do you like the fact that they kept going back to the past to kind of justify what was happening in the present? Or would you have preferred maybe a more, cyclical story around you know hey let's start from the beginning and let's try to build up to where we're going now no i really like how they go back because that really gives you a better understanding of of how we got to where he is and who he is as a person and like you said to your point um the way that he played outside with his brothers and his brothers like really beat up on him especially the oldest one you know he was the most dominant player you can win against him, but that really gives you a deeper insight into his mentality going forward and how he would go ahead and play these games. And, and how he talks about his father and how much he really just wanted to make his father proud, you know? Um, and that, that reminds me to that, um, the one finals in which he couldn't, um, he couldn't. He was hugging the trophy and would not let it go. Do you remember that? It was Father's yeah, Day. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, because I guess he was. Th- I'll always remember that because I watched that with with my family. Yeah. And uh, I remember it was it was a moment that like one of one of the earliest sports moments that I can remember. I was I was ten years old at the time, and but I will always stick with me because I remember the commentators saying, you know, this how fitting it is. How fitting is it that he wins his sixth. And final championship, you know, by the time we, we you know, we, 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 somewhat we learned to know, like, afterwards, on Father's Day, considering that his father was the guy that really pushed him. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was just, I, I thought that was, it's so nostalgic, you know, it just brought back so many feelings. Because to your point, that was one of, like, the oldest memories, too, for me growing up as well, um, of like I, I loved Michael. I, I loved the Bulls um, when I was a kid, and we didn't have a team in Toronto. So for us, I, I mean, every time they would show games, it would be of the Chicago Bulls. You know, not until the Raptors came along were was there that team that we could really dedicate ourselves to within the Toronto area. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I remember 
I remember wearing like all this bulls gear. Um, I remember just like pretty much like the ad goes wanting to be like Mike, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, the bulls gear was legendary. Like I, I still, I still want to rock old school bulls gear. Cause it was just the best. Yeah. It was just the best. Um, Another so the episode one did a great job in sort of laying the groundwork down, you know, kind of highlighting the big issues uh, heading into the season, the relationship that Jerry Krause had with the players like Jordan um, talked a bit about Jordan's background in episode two. The focus is really put on Scottie Pippen and Scottie Pippen is, you know, Jordan's number two, uh, somebody who had from a stat standpoint was right behind Jordan. Um, but you got to learn a lot about Scottie Pippen and the fact that not only was he this strong utility player for for Michael, but he was also someone that was kind of devalued. Like he wasn't making a ton of money on the team. Um, I think he was what sixth, yeah. sixth highest grossing player on on the Bulls. Um, he was someone that didn't have a good relationship with Jerry Krause. He was very humble in nature, but it seemed like there was always just this need for him to ask for more. And it seemed that heading into this sixth season, the biggest conflict was him wanting to get traded because he felt his value could be increased elsewhere. Um, how did you find Scottie Pippen came across? Cause that's, he's been another device, uh, a device to figure online is some people are feeling like, Hey, did he take his relationship with Jerry Krause too far? Was he being selfish? Cause he was also injured and, Again, he made that decision to nurse his injury, not like not go for surgery over the summer because again he was heading into a, a contract year and he was dissatisfied. Or do you think he was justified in what he was doing? I, I think he was a little bit selfish, to be honest with you, because I mean at that point I to Mike what had Michael had said, he kind of went about it the wrong way in that sense of, you know, there they had a nucleus there, they were trying to build something, but I mean, he should have negotiated his contract in such a way that he could have got himself what he, what he was he felt like he was worth, but to go back and try to work on that or just to try to stick it to Kraus, um, you know, he was trying to prove all these points to him during the season, where as though it it didn't matter at that point, you know, at, at, during the season you want to really be your best so you can prove maybe to other teams that you have the ability to be that superstar player to, you know, take the team to the next level. But I just felt like he was just so mad at, at Kraus that he didn't allow himself to, you know, open up in that sense. Yeah. And, and I found it fascinating hearing Michael's take on it. Cause Michael Jordan himself felt like he was being selfish. And, you know, it, it's funny because I think Scotty's a great example of someone that truly gave it their all. And this is in any situation, whether it be sports, whether it be in business, whether it be just in life, someone who's, you know, such a big utility player, doesn't say much, does what they're told, exceeds expectations, but how they're being rewarded never matches up to the level that they're producing. And, you know, I found it somewhat relatable because I think everyone's, I think everyone's been, at a point in their life where they've taken a step back and they felt, you know what? I am worth more than what I'm doing right now, because again, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm showing up, I'm outperforming other people. But again, the, the respect is not being, not being given. And, you know, to that extent, I, I was on, like, I, I felt for him. Like I was like, yeah, this is somebody that really deserved, deserved at the time a lot more. I just, I, I guess to your point, I can agree in the sense that I feel like he didn't go about it the right way. I think there was a certain level of class that Scotty had, had you know, before I had I had knew about this situation, but kind of coming out of it, you're like, dude, why why are you almost stooping to that same level? Exactly. I I felt the same way in that sense because you're right. Like he had so much more of his self self worth. He should have or could have um, shown, and and he was just presented in such a different light. You know what I mean? Um, one of the things that really sticks out that Michael said, uh, and is so true. I mean, there is no Michael without Scotty. Yeah. I, case in point, one hundred percent agree with there. Um, I mean, they 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 won so many championships together. You know, I mean, there it goes to show how much that 
tandem worked so well together. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what's what's interesting about this, too, is um, when, when Pippen obviously uh, got drafted to go play for the Bulls, um, or actually, well, actually, originally he got drafted, what, the Supersonics, then he got traded <laughs> at the draft. Exactly. Yeah. Um, he, he, at the time, he agreed to a seven-year contract worth $18 million. And then, um, you know, you know, again, this is a guy just like every other sports story out there where it's an individual who, you know, came from nothing, who now gets this big contract and is hoping, Hey, you know what? Now I can take care of my family, take care of myself, really set myself up. And again, at the time, I don't think anyone really understood or really knew that he was getting underpaid, but then as he continued to play, you got to see that he was really overdoing it and doing a fantastic job. Um, and a lot of people are actually crediting his situation as being one of the reasons that no modern player right now uh, can really find themselves to be like in a long contract. Um, like they can be in a shorter contract, which is why you see, you know, a one year option after a one year, um, which I find fascinating. And you almost need a situation like this to take place to, to, um, to allow that to happen. So again, I think in that case, maybe Scotty was the fall guy, but yeah, it's just, it's fascinating because, you know, spoiler alert, you know, if you, again, this isn't spoilers because this is really just a retelling of what actually happened, but you know, Scotty does eventually leave the bulls uh, you know, after, after this next season, but then he decides to come back, you know, and end his career there, which again is, is quite fascinating. So I'm pretty sure Jerry Krause was still on the front board, the uh, front office there, but yeah, you know the Scotty Scotty episode. I I was very intrigued by it. I I was just it was great to to learn more about him, and to kind of see the challenges that he was facing. Um, kind of heading into episodes three and four, which you'll have the luxury of watching uh, today, which is Sunday, as we're airing the episode. <laughs> um, what are you most looking forward to? And is there anything? Based on the reaction that you saw this week, that you're that's really amping you up more around this around this series. Uh, definitely, the whole Dennis Rodman um, episode is is I'm so stoked about because <laughs> you. I remember you would see Dennis Rodman as such a character outside of the basketball court as he was on the court. Um, I remember one thing I loved about Dennis Rodman was you never knew what hairstyle he was going to have. Yeah, the hair. Exactly, right? And I remember like he was just such a fierce competitor. Um, and I think that you saw that on the court, but you were just more so for, um, fascinated by his personality. I mean, and the just overblown um, random things that he would do. And I know... Um, on the next episode, they're going to talk about the whole marriage he had with Carmen Electra. Oh my God. I can't wait. I can't wait. Like Dennis Rodman to me really epitomizes like the nineties, just yes. like a larger than life athlete. He was androgynous. Um, you know, he married himself. Like these are all things that I remember growing up hearing about when I was a kid, but not fully understanding it. So I'm super excited to your point to see to learn more about Dennis Robin. I, I can't wait. And I also can't wait to see like Michael Jordan's reaction to all this. Cause yeah. I think that's that's those are things that a lot of us aren't really privy to unless you, you know, you you really uh, you know, unless you've seen previous interviews with Michael or Dennis. But I think this will be a candid look at to, as to how Michael maybe reacted to a lot of this. Because we, we you know we know in sports now it's as soon as someone becomes a bit of a distraction off the court, it can sometimes bring some animosity on the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes to show that I, I feel like back then when there was no social media, we didn't get that really that true understanding of him. Whereas now, like, you know, we have these telltales of um, who he is, what he was all about. So I think this is really going to get a, give us a better understanding of that too. And I'm really also uh, curious to see what Phil's um, thoughts were uh, as being the head coach of that team and, and now coaching with all these personalities. I mean, 
what his thought process was like during that final season. You know, we, we do get to hear pieces in the first two episodes, but I feel, or at least I hope that there's more um, that we can really uncover. Did you hear um, about how they have all this footage about Kobe's last season? Really? Wow. Okay. That would be interesting. So you're talking about the 2015, sorry, the 2016, no, 2015, 16 season. Right. Yep. Yep. So that would be fascinating. I would love to watch that. Not because, you know, we obviously miss Kobe, but I think, I think there's a great story there because it's a legend who's, you know, up against his last season. Um, obviously wasn't playing to the same level he was playing in previous years because of injury and just what that thought process looks like as you're kind of traveling to market to market and they're all saying bye to you. Right. And mm-hmm. I don't know, that would be, that'd be interesting. Uh, you know, I, I, I love, I'm a fixture of this. As long as we're in quarantine, I'm all, uh, give me, give me all the sports documentaries. I'll watch them all. I know. <laughs> I'll do the same. I'll do the same. And that it's always fun. And when I love to, um, I guess during being under quarantine too, is you get all these IG lives as well. And I think it's so fascinating to hear from um, the likes of Shaq or um, Wade or uh, whoever it may be, Chris Paul, and just get their understandings of just regular life and how they're coping with it and, and, you know, what their motivations are. And it's just fascinating to hear old stories Um that's one of the other things that I get my sports kick from too. Yeah, I'm I'm loving the fact that Demar is still showing the Raptors love and hopping oh. on all these IG lives. It's it's good to see that the rumored animosity or all these all these things you hear in the media are, are really not true. Like you know what some of these some of these players they have a true brotherhood and um, or sisterhood uh, and uh, depending on depending on the league and it's good to see. And in times like this, people come together and, and really appreciate the past. And, and I think not only do the IG lives do that, I think the last dance does that as well. Uh, Bio, enjoy the rest of the series. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be chatting more uh, about this. Uh, if any of the listeners want to get in touch with Bio Doshi, you obviously got a podcast. You obviously are are you're actually quarantined in a very nice place uh, in the U.S. You won't disclose the location, but. Uh, you know, I'm sure your your quarantine isn't as bad as it is over here, depending on the weather. But how, what's the best way that people can reach you? Yeah, for sure. Um, people can reach me at uh, Twitter and Instagram at Piledoshi TV, and I am, as you mentioned, um, working on my podcast. Um, it is available on iTunes and Spotify. It's called Passion Projects, and uh, the whole premise behind that is we just want to shine light on people who have uh, turned their passions into their full-time careers, or even if they've kept it as their side hustle, um, get an understanding of their path and their journey to who they are. Uh, So I hope you tune in, subscribe, and enjoy. Awesome. Yeah, we'll include a link in the podcast description. That's Bile Doshi, uh, basketball extraordinaire slash legendary Toronto Raptors uh, blogger slash content creator because you, you need to you, need, you know what you need to do Bio you need to re-release all the inside in the purple room interviews because I think you you got some gems you're sitting on some gems for sure you know what they're actually all still available on um, Pile Doshi One on YouTube is where oh. you'll find all the old school purple rooms I I go back to them from time to time just to see how <laughs> different and young I look. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, you still look the same as when I first met you like 10 years ago. So don't even worry. Um, you. You. But yeah, no, this was great. And yeah, honestly, post some old clips of uh, of a young Damar if you can. Because I Wait, oh, didn't you get a Rudy Gay interview too? I, di- I got a Damar one. Um, back in the day, it was just before opening day. And I did this whole little piece on them. Um, I do have something with uh, Rudy Gay as well that's in the oh archives. You might have to scroll it up. I have to pull it up and like put it up on my Twitter feed for you guys. Actually, actually, cl- uh, quickly, what was the most obscure interview you got during that time? And uh, and obscure in a good way, but like, what was what was the interview? Because like, uh, people always love posting about previous Raptors players before the generation that we have now but what was what was one that you're like you know what this is uh like looking back that was that was a fun one 
<laughs> I know they were they were all really fun. You know what? It was actually fun. I used to do these like cool little interviews with uh, Amir Johnson and Oh, Amir. I miss Amir. Yeah, it was one media day. Um I remember I had put this uh, piece of paper together about all the goals that he has for the season and um it was top defensive player of the year um or the defensive team um make the all-star team um, and it was a bunch of other things. And I remember presenting that to him and doing this fun little feature with him about it. And, um, he was just so, so nice, you know, I mean, we, we struck like this great bond, um, together as like a reporter, um, to an athlete. And, um, I remember he was one of the, actually we had made the front cover of the Metro together. And oh, was sweet. Like, that was that was awesome. That was really cool. He was he was so fun to work with. Um, even like old school ones, like De- Demar was great. Demar was so young, you know. Yeah. Um, who else was? Oh, um, Grievous Vasquez. Oh yes, Vasquez. Right? <laughs> I remember interviewing him at a practice one day, and I remember our conversation was legit literally 10 minutes long and I had been told I only had like maybe two three minutes with him and he just kept on talking and talking it was great it was such a great conversation uh and um I think that was a Kyle Kyle Lowry was good too I didn't really uh, like Kyle Lowry I had brief conversations with during and a lot of them were done during media days when we got the media access to them yeah um so those were fun, but nothing uh, I would say is like a really nothing really stands out like. Yeah, now, now now that I think about it, you you pretty much were interviewing a lot of the legends, so never mind, <laughs> <laughs> including Vasquez. Oh, who can forget Vasquez? Right. Oh my God, Bile, this was so much fun. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. We are going to take a quick commercial break here on New Theory Radio, and we'll be right back on News Talk Saga Night Sixty AM. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Uh, 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 uh. Moving cool. You already know. Every day I wake up, I thank God. Shawty do her makeup before her job. I'ma get my cake up, but not rob. I'ma throw it straight up like a lob. Every day I wake up, I thank God. Shawty do her makeup before her job. I'ma get my cake up, but not rob. I'ma throw it straight up like a lob. Boom shakalaka. Me a noise like Jordan and Pitt. And we're back here on New Theory Radio and you're live on New Stock Saga 960 AM. My name is Nav Manuel. I am your host. And this is the show where we theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture, and everyday life. And uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm super excited to have on the line right now uh, two of my homies. I've managed to travel with them uh, various different places, whether it be performing at shows in downtown Toronto or going out to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Uh, they are one of the premier duos that, uh, that put out fantastic music. They actually just put out a new record recently produced by Empower entitled Out of Breath. And uh, I'm excited to have them here on New 3 Radio. One person uh, who's been on the show a couple times, another one I've been meaning to have on the show, and I'm glad we're finally doing it. It is moving cool themselves. I got noise and be magic here. Boys, thanks so much for joining me here on New 3 Radio. Appreciate it. Yo, thanks for having us, man. Thank you for having us. Yeah, long overdue, and definitely. And, and I asked this question to all the guests that we have on the show. Um, how are you guys holding up right now, man? This quarantine is obviously really crazy, and... And as creators as you guys are, like, I'd love to understand what's going through your, your minds right now as we're stuck inside. Uh, it's it's a, it's an adjustment for sure. Like just specifically talking about it from an arch perspective, uh, just little things that you miss. Obviously, there's the big things of like, you know, you can't go to shows, you can't perform at shows. Like there's so much of the human interaction that's a big part of being an artist that you can't really engage in too much now. Like that face-to-face 
that contact, being at a show, like interacting with people in the front row, that's a, such a big part of what we do. And you can't do that anymore. Um, and even before like quarantine and everything happened, like myself, Magic, Dusty, we were meeting up regularly to do beat making sessions. Yeah, I've and seen now, that. Yeah. And so now all of that's <laughs> just kind of on hold. So it's like we're kind of just creating individually on our own in our own little in our own little silos. And we're like sending files back and forth as needed. Um, so it's definitely it's a big adjustment. Like it's it's going to take a while for I think for for the industry and for artists to figure out how to make this how to make the most of this but i think yeah. that allows for more creativity no doubt magic you actually i think you just finished building your own home studio right yeah that's where i'm uh, actually sitting right now and it, sweet, it, it feels like the worst timing for <laughs> 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 because, uh, like i just needed a couple more things just to get it done but like yeah now that i have it it's something to look forward to and uh like Noy said, it, it, it's given us time to work uh, on our craft, but like the part is the inspiration that you get from being out in the world, right? So it's yeah, like, yeah. how inspired can you be just chilling in the house all day? Like, <laughs> I, you, you can still find inspiration, but it's a lot harder than just living your day-to-day -day life, right? But, you know, hopefully once this is all done, there'll be a lot of music to put out. Yeah, that was actually a conversation I had with Dusty, like, even yesterday. And we're just talking about, okay, like, everyone's, Everyone who makes music is on this whole tip. Like, okay, I'm indoors. I'm going to start producing more out, more records. going to start writing. But then how many quarantine songs do people want to hear about? They're <laughs> all going through the same thing, right? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's, that's the difficult part of all this is, like, really finding inspiration. And even as putting together, like, a show like this, too, like, I struggle at times. Like, yo, this week, what's what else is there to talk about? Because we're all yeah. going through this. And... The only thing that's getting worse is just the news, right? And that's the thing, too. Even watching the news, it's like no one's reporting on anything else. It's like, is nothing else happening in the world right now? Straight it's kind of like man. everybody's talking about the same thing. Everyone's living the same experience, which is, like, very unique. Yeah, yeah. That's what's interesting is literally, you know, I, I went for a drive last week, and I was just thinking about this as I was driving. I was, I was like, man, as much as it's so easy to feel down on yourself regarding what's going on, like your favorite athlete, your favorite artist, like everyone is going through this. So it's not yeah. like some people aren't. And and it's just it's so it's so humbling at the same time to to see it that and see it that way. Cause it really it really hits you that hey, this is something serious and we all need to take a step back and reset. Mm -hmm. I feel like we we've gone through the first phase of realizing how serious it is and like staying home. Right. And then now it's kind of like this realization, like, yo, this shit ain't, isn't about to end anytime. <laughs> it's not, no. <laughs> so it's like the, the first couple of weeks, I caught myself just sitting there watching CP24 or like all day and just like, you know, like being suckered into all these press conferences where they don't really oh. say much that changes. It's exactly. The day, right. But then, then I was like, I literally had to like snap out of it. Like after like two weeks, I'm like, okay, oh, I'm just going to stop watching it. And I'm going to just get my certain tasks done throughout the day, right? And, like, after a couple of days of doing that, like, you know, I felt refreshed. You know, I didn't feel mm -hmm. all down about what's going on. And then, you know, now, every now and then, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in to see what's going on because I want to yeah. be informed. But, like, you know, I don't want to I don't want to drown in the information that's coming out either, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it was such a routine, man. It was such a routine, even when you work from home, like, just to go downstairs, watch that. Trudeau press conference, watch yeah. Doug Ford do his thing, like tune in, get the updated numbers. And every day it was just, you know, it was like a punch in the gut, right? Like there was something different and, and well, actually not, it wasn't anything different. The numbers are different, but it's the same story like every day. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you, Magic. Like I, I haven't, I, I stopped. Like at one point, I think I, I saw a Trudeau press conference and I was like, he's saying the same thing he said yesterday. Like just, yeah. it's just, it's fear mongering at this point, right? Yeah, it's important. Like, it's important to stay informed, but recognize within yourself when that information is becoming a detriment to your own mental well-being, and know when to take a step back. So, just kind of being more disciplined with how you intake information and when you're exposing yourself to information. Yeah, no, I feel you, man. And what's awesome about this is obviously, as artists, you're seeing a lot of people use this time to put out music that they maybe have been sitting on for a while or have been meaning to put out. And it's a lot different because I think you guys are amazing performers. I know you guys like being on stages. I know you guys like interacting with the fans. But you guys did put out a record recently uh, called Out of Breath. 
Uh, maybe shed some light on how it came about and uh, how the collaboration with Empower happened too. Yeah, so in 2017, uh, Magic and I were in Vancouver for a show. And as part of that show, there was um, a part where someone was airing uh, like a short film that they were working on. Mm. And so there was a panel discussion with the uh, with the people who shot the film and the people who edited it. So then afterwards, after we performed, we we you know we had a conversation with the the, the guys who shot the film, and one of them was in power. Um, so I was asking him specifically about some of the music in the film because I hadn't heard it anywhere. So I'm like, you know, where, where's that music from? And he said, well, I made that. Oh, wow. So not only was he incredibly talented with, you know, filming and editing, but he had this whole other, you know, talent that he was so good at, which is, uh, you know, music production. So when we came back home to Brampton, I just kept in touch with him. And I said, yo, I'd love to hear more stuff that you've got. So we just stayed in touch over email, over WhatsApp. And he just kept sending me beats. And... He was working on an EP as well, um, so he's kind of been slowly releasing music. Like he's put out stuff with um, Saint Soldier out in Vancouver. He's put out nice. stuff with uh, Raginder in California. So he's he's doing his thing. And one of the beats that he sent us was the beat for Out of Breath, and I shared it with Magic, and that was pretty much it. It was like, as soon as we got it, it, we kind of brainstormed a little bit as far as what we want to talk about, and it was just like it was go from there. That's sick. That's it. Magic, how does it feel to put out music again, man? Because I know everyone's been waiting. <laughs> uh, it feels amazing, man. Like, it, it, it doesn't feel real, to be honest, because it's been so long since I did put out music. And, like, now having, you know, now being able to release mu music const uh, constantly again, you know, it, or consistently again, it's, it's awesome. And, uh, you know, like that, like the feeling of, like, when you when you release a record and get to share that moment with fans like that that's something that inspires you to to keep making music and keep keep trying to do better than what you did before right because you know you can tend to hate these songs the longer you sit with them all right oh, yeah because i bet i i know with myself like i like to overly critique our own music the most right mm -hmm. so the longer i sit with it the more like i can nitpick at every little thing right so I feel like a couple, a couple of these songs, like we, it was just like, okay, oh, we have them to the best we can get them right now, and let's just let's put them out there, and and the reception has been, it's been great so far, and it kind of makes you realize it's like, okay, yo, you don't need to have it perfect, get it to a point where you're personally happy with it, but you can find flaws in anything if you really want to just sit there with it, right? So, I don't yeah. Know. We We've had a I had a conversation I think noise with you on the show last year about uh, perfection versus completion, and yeah, and we I, talked about that with Dusty. Yeah, and it, because when you guys put out Lo-Fi and just I know that was like that seems to be the, just a consistent thing in general. And, and to your point, Magic, I'm finding that now because everyone's in the state that they're in, it's almost like just put it out, like just you know sit on it, make sure it sounds good to you, but everyone's just fiending for content right people just want to be distracted with what's going on and i'm glad you guys were able to put it because even the lyric video is fired did, did empower do the video too he did yeah so he it is uh, sick. yeah he did an awesome job with that yeah yeah because again man we all have the time to consume it so why mm -hmm. not take advantage of it right is this uh is this a sign of things to come is this like the first track of a of a project or what uh, so me and Magic, we've we've talked for years about a Move and Cool album or EP. And last year, I think, yeah, it was last year, last summer, we just kind of made it a point to meet up more regularly. And we just met up at Magic's house. We'd set up like a home studio in the closet. <laughs> and we would just we would just get beats from whoever. And we would just write and record. And we were just sitting on like a handful of, of tracks that we're going to put out this year. And it was kind of a way just for us to kind of, um, you know, improve our chemistry and, you know, just get your reps in. Kind of like practice in a sense, where it was like, we didn't take these songs too seriously, but we just wanted to have fun with it. Right. Yeah. Just bring the fun back to the art. Because uh, with Lo-Fi, because it was such a, a serious project, you know, we had to be a bit more calculated with how we presented it, how we did shows with it. But the stuff me and Magic were doing last summer, it was just like, all right. Don't overthink it. Let's just have fun. Get beats from whoever. Whatever we like, we like. Let's go. If we don't like it, we'll write to it. If it doesn't come out, well, whatever. On to the next one, right? So it was just like, just kind of existing within that creative flow and not taking the time to overthink to the point where you fall out of love with something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, man. Because it, it, it is very easy. It's very easy when you get in that mode where everything needs to be calculated that 
you kind of you may may discredit something that actually sounds pretty good right just because yeah. you're in a different mindset of like oh it needs to be this it needs to be that but i'm glad that you guys are, are doing that or you guys did that last summer because i think that that's where the fun out of making music started right just kind of linking up and you know sh- for lack of a better term just shooting the shit and see you know what happened what, what sticks what doesn't right yeah those are usually the like the best sessions are just the ones that are just you know some of our best songs have come out of spontaneous recording sessions you know and the more that you try to plan for something it tends to not go that way so <laughs> so it's like we kind of went back to 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 the basics in a sense to uh, with just like okay record anywhere let's just let's just create let's just go back to mm. the fun part because we spent a couple years having to operate like an independent label and figuring out everything from marketing to fucking recording to music videos and everything so it's yeah. like when, when you do kind of a lot of the background work yourself you kind of lose sight of the main thing which is the music mm. right mm. and we kind of just had to chin check ourselves and be like okay oh you know like a lot other stuff is happening and that stuff is important you need it but let's let's make time in our schedules to at least create new stuff even if we're working on putting other stuff out let's just keep sharpening the skill that we have right yeah and, and through that a lot of these moving cool records that have been put out and are going to be put out this year have come from that and it kind of just builds towards this uh moving cool album that we're trying to do so sweet it's it's kind of it's kind of like okay let's create a a a healthy and uh like a healthy competitive atmosphere and then and then let's lead into this album knowing that yo we're at the top of our game right now right what what is it about the way you guys work that allows it to to work to work well for you guys because you guys have been you guys have been now a duo or even the moving cool partnership has been what like over 10 years old now right yeah yeah, it's been like, a, it's been a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what 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 what's been the what's the secret sauce? Like, what's the formula and 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 what's what it what really has it been with you guys that's allowed this to last this long? I think any partnership, any you know, uh, any type of relationship, anything where you're working closely with another person, I think there has to be some degree of you know, friendship or compatibility to some extent. I think like that is the basis of everything. Mm. Um, Cause like a lot of times we'll just hang out and, or we'll just talk about whatever. It doesn't even have to be about music. Um, and I think that that kind of allows us to, when it is time to get down to business is like, we know that we have each other's back because this goes even beyond music. Um, so at least for me, that's kind of what I feel is a big part of why we're able to, well, number one, stay together and work together for so long. And then number two, just be so comfortable with each other is because like there's a real friendship behind it. It's not just a music thing or it's not just like an art thing. And I think two is like we communicate about everything. And when we're working on a track, it's like if Magic is starting a verse and he just has like a couple of lines, has a direction, he'll send it to me and then I'll like try to build off of that or vice versa. And sometimes if we're like, you know, if we have a direction that we're a bit uncertain about and it's like, well, this is where I'm kind of thinking of going. What do you think? And then we can kind of, you know, pick each other's brains or just offer a little bit of critique. So it's just uh, openness and honesty and communication, I think, is a big part of it. And just uh, trust mm-hmm. as well. Like mm-hmm. if I want to try something that I've never tried before on a track, then, you know, I trust him to be honest with the feedback, whether good or bad and vice versa. So I think just kind of having that no judgment space and being able to give and receive criticism is a big part of it. Yeah. Magic, you got want to add anything? Yeah. Um noise pretty much like said it perfectly, right? It's we yeah, we met through music, but the our friendship that kind of grew behind the scenes of music is the reason why moving cool kind of became and why it's so effortlessly right we've Mm -hmm. always been we like we are two totally different people like personalities everything but you know what the main thing is we have respect for each other and we know the type of people we are like what you see is what you get you know our morals and our our family values are very similar 
So even though we are different people, when it comes down to decision making and stuff like that, we come from a standpoint of let's do what's best for for the whole whole group, right? Mm -hmm. So that just made it a lot easier for me to get along with noise. And and the more our friendship grew, obviously that translated to being more comfortable around each other on, on the actual song itself and in the performance aspect as well. And the more that grew, the more moving cool got better. And like you said, it's been 10 plus years. And the main thing is when you're in a group, you want to have some type of respect and admiration for the people that you're working with. And I feel like if you do have that, then 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 you already know that the other person is going to come with that fire. And when you're working with somebody like noise, like, you, you know, like a lot of the time I say, like, I go into every verse thinking, yo, I got to bring my best. Like, you know, like this, I know what noise is capable of. But that's the thing. It's like, yo, that's made me a better MC. Right. Yeah. It, and just, you know, uh, beyond that, it's made me a better human. Just just knowing a person like noise as well. Right. So I feel like that is the reason it's grown to this part and the reason why this will keep going into the future as well. What's fascinating this week in particular is that uh, obviously uh, the Last Dance documentary dropped with Michael Michael Jordan profiling the Chicago Bulls in ninety seven ninety eight and you know the duo between him and Scottie Pippen comes up a lot in regards to Michael Jordan. Thought I was saying there wouldn't be uh, uh, Michael Jordan if there if if it wasn't for Scottie Pippen, and then even just. This past week, um, Mob Deep, who one of the strongest, most legendary duos in hip hop, uh, were celebrating 25 years of the release of their classic album, The Infamous. Like you think about those two uh, examples and, and just the longevity and the legacy that exists, it really does show how when you find that right partnership, how long lasting it can actually be and, and how impactful it can be for not just that moment but for plenty of years um just wanted to kind of throw this out there just to kind of get your perspectives i feel like i might know some of the answers to these but uh whatever i think it's worth just talking about it here on the show um what are some of some of your favorite duos when it comes to music sports pop culture and and why like why do these why do these partnerships matter so much to you uh, I feel like there's there's like two lanes of duos for me at least. I feel like one is where there's two people that are very similar, um, but they they kind of amplify each other in the sense. Like you look at um, like the first Clips album where you had like Pusha and uh, and Malice, or even like Mob Deep with Prodigy and Havoc. Like yeah. both of them, like stylistically, I find them to be pretty similar. Um, so it's like it just adds to like the ethos of what they're building. But then I feel like you have other duos, like an Outkast where the personalities are so different that bringing them together somehow just creates something brand new. Um, so I think, like, I don't know if there's a... I don't know if one is better than the other as far as, like, is it better to have two people that are very similar or two people that are complete opposites? But I feel like both of them... I like both of those characteristics as far as as far as what I look for in duos is, like, like that's how... I think that just kind of uh, it shows their greatness in the sense of, like, two different ways to go about it. So like Outcast, like I said, a Mob Deep, even like a Ghost and a Ray, um, uh, even like a Gangstar too. You know, like you look at Primo and Guru, like the way that they did it. Um, and I think that's that's an interesting or like a different dynamic too, where it's like looking at producer and MC. Um, because as a producer, you kind of have to recognize, okay, this type of beat would sound good with this type of voice. And it's like, it's, it's I guess it's a different uh, method of collaboration versus when you have like two MCs. On that point, then just more so about like recognizing potential within the artist that you're working with. Yeah, there is that. It's funny when you bring up the rapper producer combo because I my biggest dilemma when it came to Gangstar was hearing Guru on a non Primo beat. Yeah, and like I, I know he's done it in the past, but I just for me like it was so ingrained in just my fandom of that group. That, you know, Pr Primo working with other artists didn't matter because Primo was the sound. But when I'd hear Guru not rap on a Primo beat and towards the end of Guru's life when he was doing those albums with Solar, like none of those really hit with me, man, because that chemistry was was unreal. But then when you think about an outcast as an example, like, yeah, both Andre and Big Boy, like I find that they both have their styles that even after they when like when they come together, it is like the Avengers. Like they become even powerful, even more stronger than ever. And 
it's it's yeah I, I think you i think you hit the nail when you kind of mentioned that you know you don't necessarily have to be different or the same but i, I guess it really depends on the situation magic what do you, what do you think I feel like uh, like when like when you when it comes to like somebody like Outkast, right? Like, yeah, they are, they can do their separate albums, but the nucleus of that sound is still staying within the circle of the Outkast. Yeah, family, right. So it's like yeah. for for them, it's it's cool because you get to see them be their own uh, their own entities, but it still feels like an Outkast record when you listen to a Big Boy album. Or when you hear hear Andre, like it, it, it feels like it's under that umbrella. So it yeah. works well. It, it doesn't tend to always work like that, right? Like you can hear, you, like you know, there was a couple Prodigy records after Mob Deep that I didn't think were the greatest, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that might just be because I thought them two being together is such a good thing that when you hear them separate, it doesn't feel as good. Yeah. So I, I've I've seen I've seen it work and I've seen it not work, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like I don't, I don't know. Duos, like sports duos, was always a huge thing. Music duos has always been a big thing. But like for me, like the likes of like every for me growing up, even in Norway, it was huge to see the impact of like Kobe Bryant, Shaquille exactly. O'Neal. Yeah, like you know, like my brother told me all about Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen. Like I had a, I bought my my first ever basketball jersey was a Michael Jordan jersey. That I bought in Sweden. Oh, I was like, I was like crazy. Yeah, so it's like that was I didn't even know what basketball was until then, right? But yeah, it's yeah. like yeah, it has a huge impact. But I am happy that Jordan says that that Jordan said that yo, know, there is no Michael Jordan without Scottie Pippen because I, I feel like people should understand when they're in a situation like that as a duo mm -hmm. that you 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 People respect the whole, and and I hope that them themselves respect each other as well. And yeah. I feel like it always kind of annoyed me too when people talked about Outkast and they're like, "Oh yeah, Andre was incredible, Big Boy was whatever." It's like, <laughs> no, you can't you can't say you're a fan of Outkast and yeah. you know, discredit Big Boy like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's, that that's such a new fan thing to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as a kid born uh, in the, the 2000s. Yeah. Magic, you're a big soccer guy. Are there any soccer duos? Because I'm not too familiar with soccer, but are there any like two players that just went really well together? Yeah, so like usually like when it comes to soccer, like the duos will either be like the center back partners or they'll be the center midfield partners, or it'll be like if it like nowadays they don't really do two strikers a lot, yeah. but whenever there is two strikers, so it'll be like Two strikers who played really well with each other. It'll be like two defenders who played really well with each oh, other. Okay. There's like a couple classic ones from different generations, but when there's eleven players out there, a duo like yeah, they can help either in the attacking sense or in the defensive sense. But mm -hmm. there's so many players out there that it takes it literally takes a whole team. But yo, yeah. shout out to shout out to Steve Eiserman and Sergey Fedorov. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. My duo, my my duo back in the day was uh, Yager and Lemieux. Yeah. Oh, the yo, the Yager squad, Lemieux man. combo was crazy, man. Deadly. Yo, yeah. it was so crazy. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to see, man. And that's that's the one thing too is you know obviously now in this generation you know you got the Splash Brothers and you got like whatever relationship we had in toronto when demar and kyle were together like you have these these tandems that stand out but yeah man you always got to go back to the classics any any duos and like we talked about music we talked about sports any in pop culture like obviously everyone's always like batman and robin but i always feel like batman and robin always had like batman always had the inferior complex over robin because it seemed like more of a mentor student relationship but what yeah. do you guys think um hmm. actually one that was one that came to mind as I was thinking about it before we came on the air. It was um, in Community when you had Abed and Troy. <laughs> I, that was a that was a dope duo. I feel like that was like the highlight of the show. Yeah, yeah. Magic. Do you have an example? Pop culture. <laughs> um, Step Brothers. I don't know, man. <laughs> Step Brothers is a classic duo, man. Yo, Step Brothers is crazy. And, uh, I, I, talented I, night, <laughs> man. They were great. I was thinking like. Like Will Smith and Carlton. Mm -hmm. 
Like for Fresh yeah, Prince. But then like Uncle, you need a Uncle Phil. You yeah, need, you do, you do, you do. You definitely you need, need old Aunt Viv. You need new Aunt Viv. You know, like you know, it's you can't like it's a package. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I have to ask you guys, what's a good wrestling duo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, two, two that are coming to mind is just kind of uh, going back to my whole thing about like the dichotomy of duos. So one is like. Two guys that are very much similar is like one that pops to mind is the Legion of Doom. Oh yeah, yeah. Like Animal and Hawk, both guys are just like, you know, rough neck guys beat you down. But then the other one is like guys that are polar opposites is um Heart Foundation with uh, Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had yeah. the one guy that was like the muscle, the one guy that was a technique. I think Gorilla Monsoon called them like a Ferrari in a tank. <laughs> <laughs> yo and, and you guys have a track called her, her foundation too man so, yeah so who's who's the ferrari in the tank of this tandem <laughs> <laughs> well, i'll take the tank <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah wrestling is always a fascinating one because you know sp- especially when you talk about tag teams there's always that notion that one of the guys is greater than the other and will go on for superstardom when you think about, you know, Sean and Marty from like the Rockers. But hey, man, even just last night when I was watching SmackDown, like Triple H and Shawn Michaels, man, that was a strong duo. Like both mm-hmm. guys have their own legacies and, you know, have, have been able to leave their mark. And, <laughs> and yeah, they when they even though sometimes the stuff that they do doesn't really hit nowadays, like there's still a an, an chemistry there that, that works because they're just homies. Right. So that's cool. Yeah, man. Like, um, I feel like I used to lo- like, even when I was younger, the like tag team matches were the dopest because like, you know, it's, it's more characters added to, to the scenario. Yeah, right. Exactly. It, it, like this can go any way. And depending on, <laughs> on who it is and their personalities, it can go into a different way that it, it wouldn't normally, right? If it's just two two uh, two wrestlers together, but like, I feel like Hardy Boys growing up was hectic. Yeah, Hard, man, like some up. of those Hardy Boy matches, like th- there was a lot of dope tag team matches around then, and like a personal favorite because it was two dudes who seemed completely different, but they gelled so well together was. Uh, was uh, Road Dog Jesse James and uh, <laughs> Billy Gunn, man? Uh, yeah. So good, man. Yo, those two guys when they came together, they like saved their jobs, man. So yeah. <laughs> that was just like natural chemistry. Uh, one last question: If there was like a hip hop duo, being that you guys are a hip hop duo, that you'd love to see come back together and do an album, who would it be? And I feel like I already know the answer, but I thought I'd ask you guys anyways. <laughs> uh, for me, it's Outcast Clips. <laughs> the yeah, usual ones, yes, yeah. The, the but, but, but considering like Clips is an interesting one because we know that Malice has found God. We know Push is still keeping up with what he's doing. Do you think if they were to come together, like it would still work? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to Hell House Fury, man. Oh. I know, I know, I know. I, I talked about it last week that the clips like discography is just legendary. Like you can't touch that. Yeah, I think as far as like duos, I'd like to see uh, just kind of like the long rumored ones where they have like a ton of collabs but nothing official. So like Nas and Primo mm. or Nas and AZ. Like those are just a couple that kind of spring to mind as far as like duos I'd like to see. Kendrick come back Cole. in some form yeah kendrick and cole yeah yeah i want i want black star man i want that black star album to come out yeah man that rumored <laughs> album with black star and mad lib which yeah. has been like rumored for 10 years now for so point. many years and they came out with two songs and i was like this chemistry is unreal like it's on um, yeah. to me i think it'll be on par to the high-tech chemistry so oh yeah hopefully yeah. man that comes out boys this was fun thanks so much uh what what so how can how can the audience reach out to you guys uh maybe check out the new music what's the best way to to hear it hey the floor is yours uh you can check me out online at noise hip hop so that's n o y z hip hop across all platforms uh I've also got the website up and running noisehiphop.com awesome magic what about you man what's the best way to connect with uh, uh, the yeah. magic during the quarantine <laughs> At the Brown Magician or at Brown Magician, depending on what you're on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the music will be on all platforms going forward. So yeah, Dream I put Same out way. again. So that's all on all uh, platforms. And moving cool, lots of sh- and yeah, lots of music coming. 
Sick, man. Yeah, man. I actually I was listening to Dream when you put it out, man. Brought back a lot of old school memories. <laughs> the first time yeah. I listened to it again, I got goosebumps. I was like, yo, what the hell is going on, man? <laughs> hey, man. There was some there was some heat on there, man. It was good. I'm glad you did it, man. Hey, we all we all we all need content, so it's good. But yeah, thanks guys for coming on. We're gonna take a quick commercial break here on News TV Radio, and we'll be right back after this brief commercial. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Back here on News Theory Radio, you're live on News Talk Saga 960 AM. My name is Nap Nanwa, I am your host, and this is the show where we theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture, and everyday life. I'm now joined by a wonderful representative from an organization called Chatting to Wellness. Now, Chatting to Wellness is a student-run nonprofit organization that combats senior isolation and loneliness to improve mental health. Uh, They have volunteers who used to conduct weekly visits to retirement homes to chat with lonely and isolated and abandoned seniors and uh, was founded by an individual that I currently have on the line right now. I have Mahad Shazad. Mahad, who is a university student and uh, who's doing his part to uh, not only combat senior loneliness and isolation, but to also find a way to uh, do that during the pandemic that we're in currently. So, Mahad, thanks so much for joining us here on New Theory Radio. No worries. Thank you for having me. So what's fascinating about what you're doing is obviously right now, when you think about where COVID uh, is going right now in the stage that we're in and the fact that we are seeing increased cases at our elderly homes, uh, you guys at Chatting to Wellness were it was predominantly a service where you guys would visit elderly homes and really be a companion or provide some kinship to a lot of these seniors are now reverting to providing a digital service where you're still combating the loneliness and isolation that a lot of these seniors are facing as they're self-isolating like everybody else. And it's really focusing on bettering the mental health of their current situation. Um, How would you describe the work that you do and how did this idea come about? Sure. So, um, you know, I'll start with how the idea came about. It really, um, it, it started from a, a trip I took back home to Pakistan in South Asia. And um, if you don't know South Asian culture, how typically it is, is families will live in these large homes together. So I went to visit my grandparents and they're li- living with my uncle, my other uncle, their wives, their kids, a lot of family uh, in one home. And what I was surprised to see was that even in this environment, my grandparents were still eating by themselves, watching TV by themselves, doing everything on their own. And, you know, later that summer when I came back here, uh, you know, I was still thinking about it. It was still on my mind. And I said, okay, if that's how it is back home, where family values are such a huge deal, what's it like over here? And so I did a ton of research and talked to a lot of people and found that there's a huge amount of abandonment and isolation in retirement residences in Canada, really North America. And that was coupled with an insanely high suicide rate amongst seniors, more than other populations, more than youth. Oftentimes when we think about mental health, we think about youth and we think about, you know, think about suicide, we think about youth because they're very vulnerable to that and it's a, it's a big killer. But more seniors as a percentage of population die by suicide every year uh, than youth do. Yet, when I was doing this research and I was looking at this space, there is nothing there for seniors. There's no helplines, there's no free counseling, there's nothing like dedicated to seniors. And I said, and, and you know, I was 18 at the time, I was in the summer of my first year of university. Um, and I said, you know what, like, I don't want to wait until someone creates something and hope someone puts something together. I'll I'll put something together. You know, as much as an 18 year old business student can do in a space of vulnerable sector, healthcare, mental health care, I'll put something together. And so what we're doing is really, you know, taking care of a population that, you know, others really forget about. 
you know, whenever I tell people we're helping seniors through this, through, you know, with their mental health, you're like, yeah, I never really thought about that. Yeah, that's so important. Mm-hmm. Like, it's so obvious, but people don't think about it on a day to day, which is, which, you know, I get it. I understand. Um, and that's what leads to the problem. So I think we're really helping people who can't, ju- who just can't get help otherwise. Yeah. And I can definitely relate in regards to the fact that my mom herself, uh, you know, is a personal service worker at, at an elderly home and hearing the stories, and this is even before COVID-19, but just hearing some of the stories around loneliness and the fact that a lot of these elderly folks, their families don't come visit. They're dro- left at the home. They probably get, you know, a couple of visitors every couple of years, most of the time based on their physical state. They may not be the most active. Like, it's really a depressing end to a life, if you ask me, in regards to the situation that they're in. And again, some senior homes are obviously different than others, and it really depends on the health of, of, of a person and their well-being. But it's it's crazy to see what actually takes place. And especially now, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that a lot of our senior homes are being affected, it seems that the isolation is increasing. So you guys are actually now with your, with your group of volunteers, you guys are now offering a service where by phone every weekday evening, you guys are offering to chat with seniors and it's a volunteer run phone call program. Do elaborate on what this is about. Sure. So um, as you mentioned, you know, there's there's a huge risk there with the pandemic uh, in the home. So we had to pause those operations. And, you know, when we paused, I felt a little bit of like, okay, now we can take it chill and, you know, nothing's happening. But literally like two days later, I was like, okay, this is not (laughs) acceptable. Um, I've had my vacation. Um, These people still need our help, right? There's groups of people who still need this service, who still need this care. Um, And now even more so, right? So now it's more seniors who don't have family or friends visiting retirement homes, but also LTC long-term care, also hospitals, and also seniors who live on their own, who may not be able to go to the community center where they've, you know, typically um, been socially engaged. There's a lot more people um, who need that support. And so what we did was we took our chatting sessions online, which have been really great so far. Um, early 2020, we passed 3000 chatting sessions of these one-on-one in-person conversations with three seniors where we we're just talking to them about, you know, what their life was like and what, where they worked and their interests and what they do and stuff like that. So uh, before we stopped pre COVID, we had 300 plus, uh, chatting sessions every single month, all ent- entirely student run. And now what we're doing is shifting that online. So, Seniors from across Canada, anyone, any senior can sign up on our website and we are available for them every single weekday night, Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 p.m. over the phone. And we have people, volunteers ready, waiting, standing by to talk with these uh, seniors um, about anything. You know, I, I just shared a post yesterday. And I said it's, you know, about um, the, some of the stigma. People feel like, oh, we're a mental health service and we have to be talking about something very serious. But, we're, you know, we can talk about your favorite Netflix show. We're more than happy to do that. Um, and so that's what we're, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and what I love about your initiative is it's not overly doom and gloom. Like I think a lot of people, especially with what's going on in the media, it's very easy to paint that picture that, Hey, our senior homes are, are literally cesspools of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been the notion over the last couple of days, uh, you know, based on some of the studies that are coming out regarding, the actual physical state of a lot of these homes and what's actually taking place when it comes to the workers and whatnot. It's very easy to paint that picture, but I'm glad you guys are providing a positive spin to this because ultimately I think there needs to be a positive light that comes out of this. And I think just being able to support some of these folks who again are isolated from their families more so than ever are probably even feeling even more lonely because they just have no one around them because they're being isolated from people even indoors Mm -hmm. and again mental health is probably at an all-time low right now like they're probably just not feeling like themselves even more so than before um based on the conversations that you have had so far what have those conversations consisted of you talked about netflix is there anything else that you're hearing from from these senior folks that uh, that's really resonating with you and the team? Yeah, um, you know, there's a variety of things that we've heard now as well as before. Um, we're we're just picking up with the program right now, 
So we have a couple of seniors signed up. We've reached a ton of you. So we're looking to have more seniors and more of these conversations with the current context. Um, but even before, you know, some of the conversations that we're, we'd have are, are really casual. But the, you know, so like Netflix, like your walk in the morning, like your favorite, um, you know, dinner dessert. Like it, it's just it, one of the things is it's so casual. It's so friendly, right? The conversation that happens. But we've seen that the impact is is significant. Just having, for example, for those isolated seniors in retirement homes, um, they often aren't coming to any activities. They aren't talking to other residents. They aren't talking to um, any of the staff. But we found, we did you know, an internal study, and we found that 90% of the seniors that we speak with for three consecutive weeks will show significant improvement in their social engagement. So they'll start coming to events. They'll start talking to residents. They'll start, start talking to um, staff. Um and it all comes from like a simple first step, a first, hey, how are you doing? What are you thinking about? Right. And so the conversations can be about anything. But really, you know, fundamentally what's happening is they're building a connection. They're building a relationship. They're feeling, you know, cared for in a way, even if it's just a talk about, you know, what's going on in uh, on your favorite show. That's fantastic, man. That's fantastic. Because I think what that does is it really normalizes a lot of what everybody's going through. Um, I think it's very easy right now, like I mentioned earlier, to segregate seniors and to assume that, hey, this is a senior issue and that everyone else should just kind of worry about their own lives. But I think right. being able to add some normalcy into their lives is very much important. Where do you hope to see this go? Like, obviously, you guys have been able to pivot your efforts and now are doing these virtual calls. But eventually, what does success really look like for Chatting to Wellness? Yeah, well, I started trying to own this, you know, like I mentioned, my first year of university. And ever since then, I funded it myself. Um, you know, we kept things lean, at, you know, on a student budget. How much can you really do? Um, a lot of it was just driven by the passion, the motion, uh, the motivation to the team and just getting things done. And so we're still able to create significant results. But um, as we go into online, we need specific resources. We need specific assets and infrastructure to be able to make calls. And so for the short term, you know, what we really want to do is is have like a, a hotline that people can call in any time. But where we want to see this go, like long term, we hope to be able to establish as a charity and, and be self-sustaining and be able to focus on this full time, right? Focus on senior mental health and senior care full time. Because I think I think they deserve it. Like they need it. Um, so that's really what we're looking at in the short and in the long term to be more established as a, as a not just a small student group, but as, as a nonprofit organization, as a charity. You know, Mahad, here on New Theory Radio, we obviously theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture and everyday life. Coming out of this pandemic, just to close out this interview, what's your theory as to where senior care will go from here? You know, I really hope to see that senior care goes somewhere. Um, what we found, we've been in this space for the last two and a half, three years, and it's been a very quiet, a very um, stagnant space. Uh, not a lot was happening. And now all of a sudden we're seeing people in regular media, in regular day life saying, hey, I heard about, you know, all the dangers in long-term care homes, all the people that are getting sick, all the people that are dying and all the... You know, there's a lot of attention to it now. And I feel that in this space of senior care, whether it be retirement residences, long-term care homes, you know, anything like that, what's going to drive change is from people paying attention to it because that's our parents, our family members, our uncles in those homes. And, you know, pay, you know, by being active and saying, hey, that's not okay or things shouldn't be done this way. Why don't you have a mental health program for seniors? Why isn't there any um, resources that are available for them? Why is it that everything is, you know, when it comes to mental health, why is it just, yeah, we'll deal with it as, as we get there, right? That attention and that, you know, proactiveness to say, hey, that's not right is what's going to drive the change. And I think we're getting there. And I'm, I really hope people keep seniors um, and their conditions in mind as we get out of this. Amazing, man. Mahad, you're doing wonderful work. I'm, I'm so happy that you were able to share this, this wonderful platform of chatting to wellness here on New Theory Radio. Uh, if people want to connect with you and want to learn more and want to even get involved, because we do have some listeners that are in the university age demo that are probably looking for opportunities to really give back. And I think this is a great opportunity, great opportunity to do that. What's the best way to connect with you in chatting to wellness? 
Yeah, sure. So you can reach out to us at www.chattingtowellness.ca. Um, you can get access to our online chatting sessions there. We have forms to sign up yourself as a senior or sign up a friend or a family member. So we have forms for others as well to register someone else. And we have uh, a volunteer interest form. We've had a ton, a ton of people in the last week reach out. We've nearly doubled, almost tripled our volunteer base since then. Um, so please do, if you're interested at all, uh, you can sign up there. Amazing, man. Amazing. Um, honestly, Maha, keep up the great work. We're always here to support all the wonderful things that you're doing. And uh, and yes, uh, our, our seniors definitely need our support more than ever right now. So do your part. Get in touch with Mahad and Chatting to Wellness and uh, make an impact as we all can definitely use it right now during this pandemic. We are going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back here on New Theory Radio on News Talk Saga 960. We are back here on New TV Radio, here live on New Stocks, Saga 960 AM. My name is Nav Manuel, I am your host, and this is the show where we theorize on all things current affairs, pop culture, and everyday life. This concludes this week's edition of the show. Special shout-outs to Bile Doshi, Be Magic, Noise, as well as Mahaj Shazad for joining me on this week's episode. It was a pleasure speaking with all of them. And uh, next week, we will be talking about episodes three and four of The Last Dance. So you have the entire week to watch it on Netflix, which I believe will be airing uh, as of uh, April 27th. Or if you're in the U.S., it's airing uh, tonight. Uh, which is the 26th, so definitely enjoy it. And we'll be talking about it with another special guest who will be uh, announced later in the week. But if you want to connect with New Theory Radio, it is at New Theory Radio on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you want to connect with me, it is at NavNanwa on Instagram, at NNanwa on Twitter. Please connect with Saga 960 AM for all the latest updates and all of our shows. It is at Saga 960 AM across all platforms. Special shout-outs to my homeboy, Dusty Loops. Hit him up, at Dusty Loops. He's the man responsible for our theme song. Special shout-outs to my baby bro, Amit Nanwa, a.k.a. at Colorblind Photography underscore. He's been working on all of our awesome graphics, which we have been posting on social. And yes, please continue to stay indoors, stay inside. We are all fighting this together, and we shall continue as the results are definitely looking better than than, than expected. So um, please continue to do your part and stay indoors as we uh, continue to fight COVID-19. Thank you so much for tuning in, and you will hear all of us next time. Peace.